I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. Uh, we are happy to join with you this morning as we look at the induction candidates with whom we'll be working this year who need support with RECA. Um, before we actually start, I just want to draw your attention to some practical considerations. We are running this meeting as a Zoom, webinar Zoom. So the features are just a tad different to a regular Zoom meeting. If you look on the toolbar, you'll see there is the chat box, which is a consistent feature of Zoom meetings. And in that chat box right now, we put a link to the bit.ly that will take you to the slide deck for today's presentation. The slide deck is also on the main screen there. It's bit.ly slash NTLD Rika Slides. Um, to the extreme right of the toolbar, you'll see that there's a Q&A feature. And this is the feature that we'd really like you to use if there are questions regarding the material that we're covering uh, in the course of the presentation. Um, I'm sure that you've participated sometimes uh, in presentations where the chat box is used. And it's really, really difficult to keep track of conversations there. So we'd ask you to please target using the Q and A feature for any of the questions that you might have in the course of the meeting. We'll try to keep track of what's in there. And um, we may stop and get some specific questions at a particular point in the presentation if we feel that there is a lack of clarity or people have a lot of questions um, regarding one specific piece. So to start, uh, my name is Mary Dolan and I'm the administrator here at New Teacher and Leadership Development at the Tulare County Office of Education. Um, if you take a look at your screen, you'll see that I have three other people that will help me this morning, Michelle French, and Michelle coordinates the multiple subject component of our intern program. Kim Paz, who uh, is the manager for the education specialist, mild, moderate, moderate, severe, and early childhood portion of the program. And Sue Winters, who was a valued member of our team, and last year she decided it's time for me to get a little more downtime and she retired from us, but we still held on to her. And she's our instructor. She's one of our instructors for the reading methods course. And she also um, still continues as a practicum supervisor. I'm thinking about those of you who are here with us this morning. Uh, there were over a hundred people registered. So I think we have about 58 on board at this moment. And if you are here, it's likely that you're responsible for the coordination of a teacher induction program. And typically at this point, you're trying to get a grasp of how many new year one candidates you have. Um, you're trying to figure out which mentors will support those new candidates. This year is different. We are going to start an induction program year in the midst of a pandemic. We are very aware that many brand new teachers will start the school year using distance learning. That's going to be a super challenging way for them to start their career. And on top of all of that, over the past two months, you discovered that some of the new induction candidates have not passed RECA. And helping them to access support and pass this test just got added to your list of other duties as assigned. If you're in the education world, even if you personally have not taken this test, the word is on the street. RECA is tough. RECA breaks hearts. RECA is a challenging assessment. And it's now your job to help your candidates who deferred RECA. Under your guidance, they will succeed. 
So as we built the agenda, we tried to really make it as practical as possible. So that if you're not familiar with the test, you can start to build in some really good basic understanding with regards to how it works. We're gonna go over the profile of the Rika warrior, the person that's in battle with Rika. We're going to help you understand what the typical path for reading preparation looks like so that you understand where these candidates have come from and what they've already done. We'll give you an overview of the written Rika exam. We will give you an understanding of the Rika score report so that as you're looking at score reports for people who've taken it a number of times, you can get a better idea of what's going on there. We'll look at some strategies for nurturing Rika success. And we will look at uh, resources that you may be able to use for nurturing that Rika success. Uh, we'll address some of the complications in the mix at the moment. And then we'll also have some times for, for, for Q&A. Um, I'm Irish and one of the things that Irish people are constantly looking for is headspace and headspace is some uninterrupted time to mull over things and think things over. So I suspect that many of you have been aware for the last two months that you will have candidates in your induction program who need to pass RECA and it has become part of your job to try and help them be successful with that test. Uh, we're hoping that today we're going to be able to give you a little headspace to think about some of the issues related to supporting an induction candidate. Here at the Tulare County office, we are actually running both the teacher preparation programs and the induction programs under the one roof. So we get to look at it from both sides. And when this idea of having people defer RECA popped up, um, I was talking with Karen Sacramento and I said, I think we could probably help to give people some resources and understanding. So that's our aim today. Our aim is to try and build a bridge so that you really have a very clear idea of the, 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 the things that need to be front and center in your mind as you think of it. If we could move to the next slide, Michelle. Um, a word that I'm gonna ask you to kind of bear in mind, and it, it may seem a little strange, is the word forensic. As you think of the people that are in this, I have deferred RECA group, you're really going to have to drill down and get a sense of who they are and what the specifics of their particular situation are. So if you could go to the next slide, Michelle. We decided just to share with you some of the data that pertains to our own preliminary programs. So we had four cohorts that exited this year, two multiple subject groups and two from special ed. Um, if you look at the two multiple subject groups, you can see that from the first cohort, there were just two people that needed to defer. From the second cohort, there were two who needed to defer. The third cohort is the mild moderate special ed cohort and four needed to defer from that group. And miracle of miracles, and I'm saying this genuinely, we were totally shocked. Out of our ed specialist moderate severe group, we didn't have anybody who did not pass the test. And I'm going to tell you from the get-go, that is unusual because typically candidates in that particular group struggle. So my suspicion is that you will see more people in the ed specialist moderate severe category among those who are in the deferred RECA group. We took a look at the data that is available. Um, each year, the commission is presented with a, a very clear drill down into what the statistics are regarding the tests that people have taken relative to um, the educator preparation programs. So as you start looking into the RECA associated with 
at the data associated with the RECA test, this is what you will find. There is a subgroup of individuals who had a low GPA, so a GPA that ranges from 2.5 to 2.99, and their success rate is poor. It's 52.3%. Those for whom English is not their first language, so if they have more than one language, their pass rate also is a struggle. Males do poorly on this test. Their pass rate is 52.4%. Mexican-Americans, 53.2%. So I think that this is one of the things that you need to bear in mind as you look at each of the individuals within your induction program who has deferred RECA, who needs the assistance to pass it. You need to be also mindful of this background demographic information and is that in play as well. There is definitely an issue regarding either the student teaching placement or the intern placement of the candidate who is taking the test. Our experience is that people who are in an elementary position where they are teaching and they're doing a lot of overt teaching of reading, particularly people that are working in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, they're in a much better place when it comes to taking this test. People who are pursuing the multiple subject credential, but assigned to either a middle or high school setting, they struggle. People who are in special ed assignments, but assigned to the high school or middle school, they also struggle. And part of the reason that they struggle is because sometimes their position is a special ed assignment, resource specialist, but they may be assigned to doing math and science all day. They're doing push in with the teacher of record and all of they're doing all day is helping students who are struggling with math and science issues. So when it comes to taking RECA, they are at a major disadvantage. The third group that struggles are those who are working with the moderate severe students. Uh, reason being, very often, the students with whom they're working are profoundly delayed. These teachers are, do little or no actual teaching of reading in the manner in which it's being assessed in the RECA test. There are also <clears throat> a couple of other things that play in that kind of I would put under the category of life. So there were people who have not done well with the test because they were out for an extended period. You know, somebody goes out on maternity leave and then they go to decide to add on baby bonding and all of those things. And they didn't take the test close to the time that they took their reading class. And it's consequently really difficult for them. Some people are just exam phobic and they put taking this test on the long finger. It's just was one of those things they planned to do and they never got around it. So it's quite likely that you will have some people who deferred RECA because they haven't actually even attempted it. By the time <clears throat> it got to the months of, you know, March, April, May, the testing centers were closed and they were not able to access them. So these are some of the background pieces that it's really pretty critical to bear in mind as you're thinking about your candidates. Um, I'm going to move over to Sue at this point. Uh, Sue actually works a lot with teaching the reading class, so she is the perfect person to look at the typical path for reading preparation. Thank you, Mary, and good morning. Um, so we'd like to walk you through the typical path for reading preparation that a candidate takes within a um, teacher prep program, whether it's a traditional program with student teaching or an alternative program such as an intern program. Usually that reading methods course is done pretty early in the program, the first year, the first semester, and then during the rest of the program, the candidate takes other courses that um, add to their reading pedagogy in ELA and ELD, all of that adding up to being proficient in teaching language arts. Some programs offer an optional RECA test prep 
course, and then ultimately the candidate attempts to take the RECA. We really encourage candidates to take it immediately after the reading course, <clears throat> excuse me, while all of those ideas are very fresh in their minds. But as Mary said, your induction candidate may be a year or two years or maybe even longer since they had that course. And so that's really something to take into consideration as you're planning to help them with this. When they take the RECA, there are two options, the written exam and the video performance assessment. If you look at the bottom line on these slides, you'll see that only 192 people attempted the video performance assessment in 2017-2018. The majority take the written exam. However, the video performance assessment is really ideal for those candidates who have struggled with taking the written exam several times, just can't pass it, when they get to video themselves actually teaching reading and demonstrate their proficiency that way, sometimes they're very um, uh, successful with that. Usually programs don't have any support for the video performance assessment and we're thinking about putting something together for that. Our pass rate is pretty high for the candidates that have attempted to do the video performance. However, as you can see, there are three videos required and three different group sizes. So until we're back in person for school, this really isn't an option. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So let's take a look at the available option, which is the, the written exam. And we'll give you an overview of that one. First, the types of questions that are on it. The content will be covered in the next slide, but these are the types of questions that are on this exam. 50% of the score is made up through multiple choice questions. There are actually 70 multiple choice questions, but 10 of them are always field placement questions and you don't know which ones they are. So there's 60 that count. Then there are two long essays that the candidate has to write. This makes up 20% of their score. The long essays require 150 to 300 words, and they address a specific prompt, either in word analysis or comprehension. There are two short essays that the candidates have to write. These require 75 to 125 words, answering prompts that deal with fluency and vocabulary. And then the case study addresses all of the domains. It's a long answer, 300 to 600 words, and it answers a prompt that involves a lot of assessment and how you would address the issues that particular student has in the area of reading. So there's a lot of writing that's required on this test. And for candidates who are successful, they really need to have some sort of strategy to address these prompts and deal with these written um, assessment parts. So on the next slide, we look at the domains, the content of the questions. There are five domains and we'll start in the lower right hand corner. The first one is planning based on assessment. This only has multiple choice questions addressing this domain, and yet all of the essay questions have to deal with planning and assessment as well. So they're looking for this domain throughout the written essays as well. Domain number two is word analysis. This has multiple choice questions and a long essay. I would say this is the hardest section of the whole test particularly for those candidates who learned how to read in the era of um, whole language. Domain three has uh, multiple choice questions and a short essay, and it deals with the area of fluency. Domain four is vocabulary, background, knowledge, and academic language, multiple choice and a short essay. And finally, domain five, multiple choice and a long essay dealing with the area of comprehension. After each candidate takes the test, then they get a score report back. We would like to take you through four of these score reports so that you have an idea of what they cover. The score report is the best starting place for understanding and developing a system of support for a RECA warrior. You can strategically look at each area and then plan activities to build their capacity in that particular area. We will only be looking at the first page of the report and the other two pages are available on the RECA website and are also very helpful. They kind of explain the background and the competencies that are being addressed. So let's look at our first score report. You can see that this is a passing score. 
If the candidate passes, you don't get to know the specific score. The minimum passing score is 220, which is 75%. And they didn't want these scores to be used for the purpose of employment or assignment. So all you get to see is that they passed. Let's take a look at the domains. In the blue circle, you can see the pluses for each domain. There are four pluses possible for the five domains, and you can see that this candidate got threes in four of those domains. They were a little weaker in fluency, but the domains that are scored the highest, weighted the heaviest, are word analysis, vocabulary, and comprehension. And you can see that they scored a three plus in all of those areas. Then down below, we have the case study. It also has four possible pluses. This candidate scored two, which still kept their score up at a passing level. And you can see that they offer um, some generic ideas for how to improve the case study, describing instructional strategies or activities and explaining how the strategies and or activities promote reading proficiency. You'll see that on every score report, they say the same thing. Not particularly helpful, but there it is. So that's our first one. Our second example is also a passing score. Um, this time you can see that they scored three pluses in um, the three big areas, word analysis, vocabulary, and comprehension. They scored two in fluency and only a one on the case study. So they didn't do so well in the case study, but still were able to pass the whole assessment. Our next sample is a non-passing sample. So once, if the candidate is not passing, the score will be shown. So you can see that this person scored 214 out of the 220 required points. Let's take a look at the domains and see what we see here. Um, we have a couple threes in planning and fluency. Those aren't weighted as heavily though. In word analysis, vocabulary and comprehension, we only have twos and in the case study, twos again. Same comments down in the case study for how to improve. And I mean, it, it is valid, but it doesn't give you a whole lot of um, information as to what to do to address that. So this person scoring 214, needing 220 is close. Um, they're probably gonna be able to bring that score up fairly easily. Our fourth sample is a non-pass where the candidate really struggled. Um, you can see that they only, scored 185 of the points required. And if you look at the pluses, there are um, twos. Um, they did score two in vocabulary and comprehension, but only a one in word analysis. And that is weighted the heaviest. That is the 33% area. So um, that's weighted heavily. And then the case study, um, two uh, pluses there as well. This person is going to need a lot more review. Um, they really struggled. They're going to need much more um, review of overall reading pedagogy and especially in each one of those domains. So I'm gonna hand it off to Michelle so she can um, give us some information about how to start to develop that plan for their success. Hi, good morning, everyone. I wanted to share with you that um, at the meetings, the commission has supported us um, with figuring out how we're going to move all of our candidates forward in this crazy COVID world. Um, the commission has repeatedly said and stressed the importance of programs, preliminary programs, induction programs, and districts clearly having an open line of communication and a holistic system of support in place. So that's where the remaining piece of um, this webinar will, will head. How do we build relationships and structure a system of support that most easily moves candidates forward to successful passing of the RECA? So with that, I'd like to take you to this slide here. Um, you can see that we have broken down uh, score bands for the RECA. And the reason that this is important is mentors and induction programs are going to need to understand where the candidate falls in a particular grade band in order to structure the support strategically. Um, mentors 
as we all know, are the foundation to all educator preparation programs, and they are highly skilled and effective educators themselves. However, many of them might not be quite as familiar with the structure of the RECA, um, how the test is administered, what the grade bands or these score bands might mean. So it's important that an induction program and you as induction program leaders take this information back to the uh, field at large with the mentors to make sure that they are comfortable in providing that really direct purposeful support for the um, induction candidate who is still in need of passing the RECA. So with that, I wanted to, to dissect these three circles here for you. As Sue showed you in one particular score report, the candidate was really close to that 220 uh, threshold score. So in that sphere of strategic support, we are encouraging the mentor and the candidate to look at what exactly those weaker domains might be and to target the professional learning and the support specifically in those domains. In the next circle, the 214 to 200 range, it's more likely that a broader um, number of domains will need to be explored and uh, practiced. So we're encouraging the mentor and the candidate to look at all of the domains, competencies, and reading pedagogy to um, make sure that all areas are moving forward. Another key piece on the assessment is the use of academic vocabulary specific to teaching reading. This seems to be a real hitch in the written components of the assessment that the candidate may have the idea of what needs to happen for a particular student, but they're not using the exact reading language that the test is requiring. So making sure that candidates in their planning for reading, in their professional learning, and the conversations that they're having, that they're authentically using this vocabulary because then that will more easily translate to the test environment. Last, we have the struggler, the person that really needs some intensive, specific guided support. Again, going back to all domains being on the table for that candidate. And in addition to that, and this would help all candidates too in passing the RECA, but in addition to that, you know, thinking back to what Mary was saying about the people who really struggle on the exam, perhaps that education specialist um, who does not teach reading or a multiple subject candidate who is teaching at the middle school level, those folks don't have the boots on the ground experiences to draw from to help them in passing the assessment. So it's really important that those candidates are able to see exemplary reading teachers in action to help them internalize what the, um, the process is for teaching reading and the implementation of teaching reading looks like. Across all three of those spheres, you can see test-taking strategies are also an important piece. When Sue was talking to you about how the RECA is constructed, there's the multiple choice, two essay formats, and the case study. Oftentimes, what gets in the way of someone passing the assessment is the actual test-taking itself. They, they over budget for one area and under budget time in another area. So that's another piece of the conversation that needs to happen when a mentor is supporting an induction candidate. So again, we're really encouraging you as induction leaders to make sure that the mentors that are supporting RECA candidates are aware of all of the parameters of the assessment, aware of where the the candidate might fall in terms of score bands and um, you know, feel comfortable in reaching out to other people on the campus or in the district to help with building their knowledge and understanding of what this world looks like. So um, across the bottom of this slide, I, I'd like to start planting a seed of awareness for you 
that those in that first band, the 215 to 219 range, they schedule to take the assessment right away and look for immediate cancellations at RECA test center locations. Um, those folks in that band will not need quite as much remediation to become prepared to take the assessment again or for um, um, and then for those that maybe have not taken the assessment at all, same situation. Start looking for the cancellations in the area um, because we want to get them in and out of the RECA world as soon as possible. And then at the other end of the spectrum, those folks that are really struggling with the assessment, we are recommending that the candidates when they're registering look for dates that are a few months out. That way it gives them some additional time for remediation, for professional learning, and for practicing teaching beginning reading, if at all possible, to help build their capacity to tackle the assessment um, within you know, a few months. And then for those in the center, you know, just using best judgment about when they think they might be ready to take the assessment would help them in making the scheduling um, of, the, of the date itself. So I'd like to now talk to you a little bit more about developing a system of support for these RECA candidates. It's um, again going to rely on a number of people. It's going to rely on data and action in order to um, to tackle the RECA. So first of all, we encourage the induction program and the on-site mentors to identify and connect the people who will best support their candidate. The reading coaches in the district, literacy specialists in the district, those exemplar reading teachers who um, perhaps the candidate can go and observe virtually or in person someday. Um, site administrators are also a fabulous resource for helping candidates to connect to materials and, um, and people. So please start talking about who in the district, who at the school site would best support these RECA candidates. The next piece in planning the strategic system of support is the purposeful targeted analysis of data and reflections upon the data. So in, um, with the commission's guidance, preliminary programs have been tasked with revising what's called the individual development plan. That document is the bridge document between the prelim program and the uh, induction program. And so now all preliminary uh, development plans will have a section specific for those who haven't yet passed the RECA or the TPA for that matter. So in that section on the IDP, the candidate needs to note what exactly is, um, is that, what, what exact um, assessment they haven't yet passed and what they plan on doing while in induction to pass the assessment. So use that as some data and some, um, some input from the candidate to help move them forward while in induction. The next piece as Sue talked to you about is the non-passing score reports. And really looking at where they fell in each of the domains in terms of those pluses, and then also the um, specific information for the case studies. And then also looking at all of the resources that the uh, candidate has access to on the RECA website so that they can really see what the explanations and expectations for all of those domains might be. And then lastly, the Tulare County Office of Education recognized that induction mentors and induction programs may not know how to initiate a guided conversation, a structured conversation with a RECA candidate um, to really get them from this is where I am now to this is what I need to do to grow in my understanding 
and this is how I am going to get there, developing a plan. So we've created a RECA support tool that we'll be sharing with you in just a moment. And through that tool, the on-site mentor will guide a reflective conversation that will then in turn help the candidate make connections to the individual learning plan that's required of the candidate in induction. So it's kind of like a, a support document for the ILP in induction. And then through the development and the implementation of the plan, we are again encouraging uh, candidates to look for relevant professional learning experiences that will support them in, in growing their practice of teaching reading, um, looking for people for the intern to go and observe and, and um, grow uh, their understanding, and then uh, video classroom observations, either with colleagues at the school district or the school site, or that are based online. And then lastly, um, RECA preparation programs. There are a number of them across the state. So those pieces can also be added to the development plan for the candidate. And then, of course, always looking for RECA test dates. That's a, a critical piece. We, we don't want the test closure, test site closures and lack of available dates to uh, prevent them from taking the and passing the RECA. So um, as I mentioned a moment ago, the on-site mentor or the um, induction mentor really have a menu of options um, when it comes to determining the level and amount of support provided to a candidate. Typically, when a, a, an induction candidate is starting the program, there's some calibrating and consulting going on, but more quickly, the candidate is led to that coaching opportunity through the individual learning plan. Um, the, the mentor takes on that role of asking questions and, and leading the candidate through self-reflection and that guided inquiry type of approach. Well, now because of the shift in RECA support, we are anticipating that a lot of the mentors are going to need to take a step back and facilitate conversations through more of that calibrating and consulting stance where there's a lot more guidance and direct support of the candidate because being an intern, a preliminary credential holder, a student teacher is stressful enough. Now going from a preliminary program to an induction program is really stressful. There's a lot of uncertainty with, you know, how school is starting and, um, you know, how to facilitate distance learning. We need the mentors to be more proactive and more um, supportive with finding resources and consulting with the, the candidate to, to to help keep them moving forward. The last thing we want to do is have the five year clear credential window close and the candidate still not having yet passed RECA. So the, the mentor needs to be that, you know, that pusher, so to speak, that advocate for the, the candidate to continue to move forward and get this done. So it's taken off of their plate. So again, please make sure that mentors know that they have resources to draw from and it's okay for them to take a more proactive, collaborative um, consulting stance. So now I'd like to take you to the RECA support tool that we've developed for the induction programs. And um, also, if any of you are in both induction and in a preliminary program world, like we are here at NTLD, Kim Paz, who just joined us, um, is one of my colleagues as a program facilitator. And we discussed that this document could also be used in a preliminary program for those who are struggling to pass RECA. And um, 
there's a lot of modifications that could be made to this document based on your program and your candidates needs. So we're giving this document to you freely for you to make adjustments and modification to meet your needs. So um, I would like one of my colleagues to make sure that the link to this document is added either to the chat box or to the Q&A box so everyone can have access to it if they'd like. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger here on the screen. So this induction mentor RECA support tool is designed for mentors to lead a guided conversation, reflection, data analysis approach to developing a plan to move forward with passing the assessment. So there's some logistical information here um, that will be helpful for the mentor to get to know who the candidate is and what the current assignment is. And then this section here is where the candidate and the mentor will record who else at the district or at the staff um, um, site staff level could be an additional support provider those coaches tosas um, literacy specialists great reading teachers we need to start getting those names down there so that connections can be made between the candidate and these individuals some additional background information that we're, we're thinking would be helpful for the candidate to reflect upon and for the mentor to know is how many times the candidate has attempted the RECA. Is this um, a problem that's been occurring over the course of the entire preparation program or did the candidate simply take the test once and not pass? Um, you can gather some inferences from the response to that question. And then we need to know if the candidate currently has a test date. That will drive a lot of how the plan is developed and implemented. And if the candidate has taken the reading pedagogy or methods class a long time ago, that's good information to have as well. Um, sometimes the candidates simply lose track of the materials and resources from that particular course. So it's helpful if the, the candidate is thinking about, hmm, do I still have my notes from my reading methods class that I could pull out and refer back to? Um, so that's a good resource for them to, to think about. And then what types of RECA preparation training and workshops have you completed in the past? So again, this is the mentor asking the intern and recording the, these answers here. Um, it's helpful for the mentor to know if the candidate has spent a lot of time in practice and in PD, um, or if there's been little attempt to reach out to programs and resources. Also, what's what has been most or least helpful in that world? That will give the mentor information to help, again, connect the candidate to the resources and materials that might best suit the learning style, the time that the candidate has to invest in the PD and um, the technology perhaps needed to interact with the PD. The next piece here is the analysis of RECA score reports. So some of your candidates may only have one previous attempt and that's okay, you can still gather data from that. Some candidates may have attempted the assessment two, three or four times. So all of that data from all of those score reports that Sue shared with you is important to analyze. Lay them all out, lay all of those score reports out. Start noting in each of the score reports, what was an area of strength, what was an area for improvement, what was the case study focus area, if they can remember that information, what is the, um, the area, of the domains from the case study that they need work with, and 
by looking at this holistically, they can start seeing over time what the trends are for areas of strength and areas for growth. And that'll allow you to focus in on specific professional learning experiences that will help them to target what they're going to focus in on. And then the next piece here is the candidate reflection. So the mentor is asking the candidate, um, you know, what they're seeing from all of this data. Um, what are their strengths and areas for weakness across the board? And why do they think they're, they're falling in an area of strength or an area of weakness? That might give them some insight as well as to how and where they're going to remediate. And then what do you remember about the experiences in taking the RECA? So this is going back to the idea of the test taking strategies itself. So um, did they run out of time? Did they, um, did they struggle with the, the case study in terms of um, not having the vocabulary and the strategies needed for the assessment? Um, how might you prepare differently or the same moving forward? How can I and other support providers um, help you with moving forward? So this is just a piece to bring all of that data together and um, figure out what they need to do. And then the RECA support plan is exactly that. So for a specific domain, um, what, what date do they want to have their research, their practice completed in order to be prepared for their test date? And then what specifically are they going to do to tackle um, that particular domain? And then we're seeing this document, again, as being a companion document to the ILP itself, the induction document that's needed. So, um, you know, feel free again to modify this particular plan and use it to fit your needs. If you're with a preliminary program and you see a need for um, support, maybe through practicum supervision, this document could be aligned to support a practicum supervisor and a preliminary candidate in a program. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Sue, who's going to take you through some resources. I love that document. It just lays it all out. You analyze the scores, you analyze the attempts and what the candidate really needs. So I think that's a super valuable thing. And Michelle's gonna get us back to our slide deck here. There we go. So we're gonna give just a, a starting list of resources that we found useful in supporting our RECA warriors. Um, there are so many out there. There's so many videos. There's um, lots of things that we aren't even on this list. So there's a lot out here, but these are ones that we found useful and these pages have live links to the particular uh, resource. So to start off, the very best one is the RECA website itself. Um, there is so much information here. This is basically a one-stop shopping um, where you can just find everything that you need to talk about the RECA right here on this website. There's prep materials. There's the practice test. This is where you find the testing centers and appointments. So this is really where the candidates need to start. Included in this site are the content specifications. And that's our next slide. And this is a description of each domain along with the specific competencies for that domain and then multiple examples of what that competency would look like. So I just have one of the competencies for the first domain shown here in this picture. This is such a valuable document. It is well worth the time to take to really dive into this and, and understand what the domain covers. Then also on the website, they have added this um, computer-based tutorial option, and it includes an interactive simulation. So if we go to the next one, you get into this and um, have the option of doing the tutorial or actually doing an interactive simulation of what it's like to take this four-hour computer-based test. And even for candidates who have done the test already, I really recommend just going through it one more time, remembering these are the things that you can do. 
On the next slide, you'll see in the middle a list of all of the items that are in that simulation. So how to navigate, how to begin, um, how to end, some samples, some more resources. And then the next um, picture is actually within that simulation showing you how to flag questions, how much time you have remaining, how to go back to review those questions. You get to see all of what you'll see during the actual exam. And I think this is extremely useful and worthwhile to take the time to prepare for this. Then there are two books that we find particularly useful. There's a lot more out there, but my favorite is the one on the left, and these are live linked right to Amazon as well. The Zorillo book has at least two chapters for each domain. There are strategies in there um, for each domain. There's assessment, there's discussion of it. He also goes into some very specific test taking strategies of how to do the essay questions and the case study. And then if you'd like more deeper or more options for the case study, the one on the right is another one that gets you um, more um, case study type questions to practice on. There are several RECA prep courses. I'm just going to show you two. This is the one that was listed in the PSD last week that is done through San Diego County Office of Ed in conjunction with Point Loma Nazarene University. I went through this myself. I would highly recommend it. It's very well done. I think they have a special deal on it right now till October that it's free. I'm not totally sure, but I very much recommend this particular prep course. Another one that I found is by Emily Muccianti, and she also has a YouTube channel and a Facebook um, RECA support group that I'll show you in just a moment. I didn't go through this course myself, but it certainly gets a lot of rave reviews from um, teachers who have taken it. And I did look at several of her videos on her YouTube channel, and they seem very effective for reviewing reading pedagogy for candidates. Another set of videos are put out by Dr. Chris Busalis, who's at Stan State, and he has his own um, uh, YouTube channel there, and he has multiple videos, both when preparing for the RECA and also CSETs, but a lot based on reading instruction. And I've watched many of his videos, and we've used those with our RECA warriors, so I definitely recommend those as well. I mentioned that there were two Facebook groups. Some people like to be in a support group like that. So these were two that I found and these link up to that particular group as well. In addition on Quizlet, they have 20 pages regarding the RECA and there are 25 sets of questions on the first page. So no need to make your own review flashcards, just go to Quizlet. Finally, as Michelle um, mentioned, if the teacher candidate is not um, teaching reading actively on a daily basis, being able to observe exemplary teaching of reading is essential. And the live observation would be the best bet and best bang for your bucks. However, in this current situation, that might not be available. So I did put links into some video sources. These are only a few. I know the teaching channel has more. There's a lot more out there of exemplary examples of reading, but these allow you, especially the reading rocket ones, allow you to zero in on the particular domain that the candidate has issues with and watch um, videos within that particular area. So I'm going to pass it over to Mary, who will talk about some of the complications. How did I get this slide? The complications and the difficulties, and there are many. Um, if you've been attending some of the sessions that CTC hosted for us, they made it pretty clear that for the candidates who come to the induction arena with RECA deferred or TPA deferred, that these items will become the focus of the ILP and that they will not engage in the usual activities and circles of inquiry and all of the things that are part and parcel of a normal induction year. Um, as we started to do our research, one of the things that has become immediately apparent is that 
it is extremely difficult to register for RECA at the moment. There is pretty much no availability uh, for registration between now and the end of December. The only availability that there is, is that random cancellation availability that will pop up. And that really involves the candidate going online and just checking pretty much on a daily basis, has somebody canceled? Now, as we indicated in the three bands, those that are very close to passing, those that have a bit of work to do, and those who have a lot of work to do, if you are working with a candidate who is in the ballpark, you know, they got 216 or 217, they're really, really, really close. It would be so great if that type of candidate can keep an eye on the RECA website and pretty much go back and check on a daily basis and see if they can find a cancellation that randomly pops up. And it happens all the time. People who have registered for the test begin to realize that they haven't done the work and consequently they adjust the registration and they push it out to a later date and their original spot becomes available. Now, we weren't even aware that you could do this up to our recent kind of crisis in trying to find dates. Um, when we finished the academic year, like as, as we started to kind of come out of complete lockdown mode, we had a very significant number of candidates in both our multiple subject and ed specialist groups who had not even registered for RECA at that point. And as soon as we became aware that it was possible to get these cancellations, we made our candidates aware. And by the end of July, we have pretty much nobody who was not able to get in and take a test. So I think that that's part of what you need to do is to help the candidate to understand that um, it's possible to get a cancellation. It's just a matter of being vigilant and forensic and going in and checking. For those that are going to need a couple of months to get ready, they really need to go ahead and select a test date pretty promptly. Um, so if they're in the, you know, below 200, the below 200 means they have a lot to do. So it would be reasonable for them to start looking for a test date February on. Um, when you actually start to look, for test dates in the new year, you'll find it's, it's all based on the geographic area in which you're looking to take the test. And you may find that in your particular geographic area that there's not a whole lot available. So one of the things that we've also kind of coached people to do is say, okay, you may have to drive 50 miles to be able to get in to take the test on the day that you'd like to take it. RECA is typically offered at least five days each month, and on some days it's offered in the morning and in the afternoon. So it's a matter of um, what do you do. Going back to the whole notion of figuring out an ILP and a game plan for the candidate at this point, given that there is such a poor availability of testing dates, um, I, I chatted with Karen Sacramento about this yesterday, and I think it's really, really going to have to be handled on an individual basis. So if the candidate with whom you're working um, has a tremendous amount of work to do based on your analysis of their test scores and the other data that you're looking at, yes, you're, you're going to build an ILP that really gives them very focused preparation and timelines and they target a date sometime early in the new year. Uh, but hopefully for those that fall into that band of being super close to pass, like 215 to 219, you can really try to get them through it as quickly as possible. I think the critical thing to bear in mind is that the, the, at the heart of induction, is that desire to support the teacher in a very holistic way. The teachers with whom we're going to be working in year one and year two, they are starting 
the year in a very unique way. None of us have started an academic year like this. So they're going to be starting a year in a way that is completely unique. So to start with, it's going to definitely be a matter of just in time mentoring. It would be um, problematic if you launched into let's get you through RECA as being the very first conversation or this front and center with your um, induction work with the candidate. The idea of providing that just in time mentoring is the most central and it's the one that we're all trained in most critically. So that's where it needs to begin. And then based on the profile of the candidate, you'll take it from there to see where you're going to move with them and the speed with which you will try to get them to start targeting a test date. That is pretty much what we have prepared for you. Um, as I've been looking at the chat, the, 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 the box with the questions and answers, a lot of people have been saying, is it okay if we use this presentation? Absolutely. Um, Michelle has glammed our presentation. We, we used Visme, which is a, a platform that we just actually started to use and it really helped us to make it look nice. But we also worked hard to try and put the content together in a way that we thought would be useful for you. There is a survey um, at the very end and we'd really appreciate if you could give us some feedback because we do a lot of this kind of stuff. So we, we'd really, really like to get some feedback to help us to do a better time, uh, a better job with it each time. Um, you have the ability to raise your hand and ask a question. So if you have a question that you believe hasn't been addressed in the presentation, something that is RECA specific or um, induction specific, please raise your hand and we'll do our best to answer it if, if, we, if it's possible. Mary, are you able to see if there are any questions? Yes, uh, Barbara Waldrop raised her Hi. hand. I'm gonna mute her mic. Okay, can you? Hi, Barbara, you should be able to speak. We've unmuted you. Thank you, I apologize. I, I put this in the chat. I just came in, I came in late, so I wasn't able to get the link to the presentation. Can I get the link to the presentation? Oh, absolutely, yeah. We'll make Thank sure that you, you get so it. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. Is there any other question? I just put the link to the presentation in the chat box, so I think everyone can see that now. Emily Richards, I am unmuting your microphone. Hi, Emily. Hello. Um, I noticed that you talked about um, at the beginning with those groups, uh, middle school, high school, SPED, that typically have a lower pass rate. I'm wondering if you have any information about how teachers um, that interact with TK or K students do. Um, I have a, a large number of TK, K, um, and wondering about that. I don't have the specific data on them. Um, they, when we highlight the, those in special ed or middle school settings, they are a group that we are just constantly aware of, that when we look at those who struggle, they are that group. Um, I think, and Sue, perhaps you can help me with this one, the test is so focused on teaching beginning reading that people who are teaching in the lower grades are just much more favorably disposed because it is what they are doing. And that's very true. Um, TK and K teachers are at such a low level that sometimes they have a harder time with the questions that are geared towards third and fourth grade or sixth grade. Um, and what I tell all of the people preparing for this is you cannot be thinking of your own class room. Your credential covers these grades from K-8 or um, 3 to 22 if you're a special ed candidate. And you have to be thinking of the broad 
um, spectrum of teaching reading to anyone. And so that's how you have to approach the questions. So sometimes it's a little harder if you're only doing the very beginning aspects of teaching reading in kinder or TK. That's why we constantly highlight the importance of all of these candidates being able to see a phenomenal reading teacher actually teaching reading. That is one of the most practical, valuable things that you can do to help them with this test. Mary, we've received some feedback that the survey link isn't working. So we will go ahead and attempt to get that corrected and placed either in the chat box or we will resave it on the slide deck itself at a later time. We'll also maybe send it to you via email because we would love to get some feedback from you. All righty. So is there anybody else or is that it, Mary? Mary Dolan, another question just came through from Lavon. She says that she doesn't have access to a speaker and she would like to know, do, she's phrased it, do you know how the revised RECA will affect our candidates or even when the revision will be offered? Um, to the best of my understanding, they are trying to eliminate RECA. Um, RICA has been getting a lot of very negative feedback because the pass rate is very poor. And truthfully, it's not aligned to the current standards. But nonetheless, there is a desire for teachers in teacher preparation to be assessed regarding their ability to teach reading. So they're working on the legislation at the moment, and there are two things that they're proposing. They are proposing that each program would be able to develop its own assessment, um, that the commission would grant, you know, like develop some guidelines regarding what needed to be in an assessment, but basically each program would be able to develop their own. And then the next time that the TPA comes up for revision, that reading would be included in the TPA so that that becomes part of the TPA. So I think that's the way it's leaning at the moment, but it's not that the actual RECA itself is that they're proposing to redo it right now. Mary Dolan, it looks like Eileen Meehan has her hand up. Okay, Mary E, can you unmute? Eileen? Hi there. Um, I have a question. You mentioned the video assessment most likely is not going to be possible during the remote learning. Is that due to the fact that they can't video the children? Yes, it is. They have to video three groups. Um, one is an individual student, one is a group of three to 12 students, and one is a group of 15 or more students. So unless they're working online and can video that and demonstrate their proficiency with teaching reading, um, that really isn't available at this point. It only gets scored three times during the year, in November, in March, and in June. So it's possible that that might be available for the March or June scoring dates. Okay, thank you. And we found it to be a particularly helpful way of taking the test for those who have been unsuccessful with the written format, you know, four or more times. Okay, I think that looks like it's it. And we will definitely reach out to you to try and get some feedback from you regarding um, the presentation today. Um, as I, we said, if there's anything in there that you care to use to um, help to provide information to other groups, be it your mentors, your um, those who are collaborating with you, we're, we're happy for you to use it. So have a great day, everybody. And thank you so much.